American universities are or were so good that companies in Silicon Valley, such as Google, explicitly modeled their corporate culture on university culture. They loved universities, even though some of them dropped out during it, but they wanted to recreate that fun, creative, uh, uh, exploratory mindset. So Google famously has its slides. I've given talks at Google and guess what? You really are a kid in a candy shop there. You've got really, really good food, lots of it, lots of variety all the time and literally infinite candy as much as you want, whenever you want. Now, um, how's Google doing now? Well, if you model your culture on college culture, you probably don't have such a great culture anymore because college culture changed a lot beginning around 2014. So that was the year that many of us first heard of trigger warnings. There was a wave of deplatformings and protests against speakers, many of whom were not on the right. Um, there was uh, the first use or widespread use, I should say, of safe spaces as a term for a place where threatening ideas would not be present. And so this article from the New York Times in 2015 about a debate between two feminists and one undergraduate at Brown said that if, if you know, one side of the debate could invalidate people's experiences and that would be damaging. So interpreting intellectual life in terms of safety and danger and damage and harm was something new. And the faculty, we had very, we had a lot of trouble understanding this in 2014, 2015. Uh, but my friend Greg Lukianoff was one of the first to really notice this change. And he, um, uh, he came to me with an idea, we wrote it up, uh, and it became The Coddling of the American Mind, an article in The Atlantic that came out in August of uh, 2015. And right after that, in November, uh, there, were, uh, there, was, there were events at Yale around Halloween costume guidance and protests. Uh, and that was uh, widely seen as the spark that launched a wave of protests around the country. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected a little more than a year later, that sort of upped the volume and the passion and there was still more political activity and protest on campuses. It was in the three or four months after Trump's inauguration is when most of the violence happened. Thank goodness there's been very, very little violence in, in all of these protests since 2014, but there was a reasonable, there was a fair amount, nobody was killed, but there were a lot of people sent to hospital at uh, the hospital at Berkeley, uh, protests over Milo Yiannopoulos speaking and other speakers. Uh, then we have the Charlottesville, uh, unite the right, uh, uh, you know, right wing, far right uh, neo-Nazi rallies, which again, ups the volume and the passion and the tension on campuses, uh, even more activism that fall. So Greg and I decided that our initial article wasn't enough. We'd learned so much more since 2015 and, uh, and the problems were getting so much deeper and more widespread that we decided to really expand it and dig deeper into the research and created this book, The Coddling of the American Mind. <clears throat> now, um, what is it about? Uh, it's about the sudden emergence of a new moral culture of safetyism which emerged on some campuses around 2014. It's not on all campuses now, but it is on most of the elite campuses, most of the large campuses, especially most of the ones uh, along the East Coast or Northeast and the, and the West Coast. Uh, but traces of it are found almost everywhere. And if you, if you are at a university or a college where there's a lot of talk about safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, bias response teams, the idea that speech is violence, if the main analytical framework for understanding uh, life and relationships is power structures and matrices of oppression, if you have the sense that there's a call out culture often for a single word, not even an idea, it's often just for a word. Uh, if this sounds familiar to you, then you are at a school with a culture of safetyism. And if these terms sound strange to you, you don't understand them, then you are not at such a school. Because all of a sudden, right around 2014, 2015, it was as though the sort of the massive collective frontal cortex shifted from front left activation, kid in a candy shop, so excited to for the start of classes, so excited to learn so much, to threat mode, where students at, especially at elite college campuses, began to think and talk as though they were fragile or their friends were fragile, and that they were in a dangerous and hostile environment at this university. And therefore they need protection from words, books, and speakers. That is the what, that is what happened. Now, why did it suddenly emerge around 2014? It wasn't there in 2012. And by 2016, it was very widespread. Why? In the book, we go through six causal threads. This was a really fun part of the book to write 
because these things really do intersect. Rising political polarization in the, in the whole country, uh, rising anxiety and depression for Gen Z, that is uh, people born after 1996, um, who first show up on campus in the fall of 2013. Uh, big changes in American parenting where we become much more paranoid as the crime rate plummets and life gets safer and safer. We freak out about child abduction in the 1990s and we don't let our kids out of our sight anymore. Uh, that's the decline of unsupervised play. There's also changes in the bureaucracy of universities where Greg is an expert. And there's a big change in the political activism. There's a new kind of social justice um, with a shift towards what you might call equal outcome social justice as opposed to social justice emphasizing proportionality and procedural justice. So I'm only gonna talk about a couple of these today, but this is the whole story here. Now, oh, finally, the book is also organized around three great untruths. Uh, these are three ideas so bad that if any young person embraces all three, it's very likely that they will be unhappy and unsuccessful in life. I'm just gonna talk about the first and the third. These are great untruths. They're the opposite of well-known psychological principles. So bad idea number one, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Um, so this is, of course, uh, uh, the inverse of the famous dictum from Friedrich Nietzsche that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And there's a very simple and powerful and important psychological mechanism behind Nietzsche's dictum, which is, uh, well, there's no word for it in the English language. So Nassim Taleb, uh, the scholar who wrote The Black Swan, wrote a whole book about this. He invented the word anti-fragile. It's the opposite of fragile. So glass is fragile if you drop it, it breaks. And so we don't let kids play with glass. Plastic is, uh, plastic is, um, uh, is resilient. Uh, if you drop it, it doesn't break, but it doesn't get better or improve in any way. And Taleb wanted to know what are systems that, that require or expect challenge or shocks in order to strengthen and grow. And so he goes through a, a bunch of them. Uh, bone is an example. Our bones get strong to the extent that they're needed. And if we uh, spend nine months in outer space, they get weaker. The immune system is the best example or the clearest example. And here I'll show you. Um, why have peanut allergies tripled in the United States in, in kids since the 1990s? In about 20 years from 1990 to 2010, they tripled. Well, uh, it turns out one of the main reasons is because in the 90s, we started banning peanuts to protect kids with peanut allergies. And when fewer kids are exposed to peanuts early in their lives, they don't, they, they don't get used to it. Their immune system doesn't get accustomed to it uh, and it treats it as a foreign uh, pathogen or an uh, antigen. And so um, a, a major study experimentally gave peanut powder to toddlers or kept them on standard advice and found uh, that they were able to almost eliminate peanut allergies by giving kids a little bit of peanut powder. Um, uh, here, I'll, this is the, the academic study. Uh, so, okay. Oh, I, I, I have a slide in here. So um, 640 high-risk infants, the mothers were recruited to the study. Half were given some peanut powder to consume. Half were told to, the mothers were told to avoid it. 17% of the avoiders uh, had a peanut allergy by age five, whereas only 3% of those who were given this um, snack food that has some peanut dust on it, um, that protected them. And that's why uh, the, the conclusion is that the previous advice to avoid peanuts was incorrect and it actually may have caused the rise in peanut allergies. Uh, and that's why the subtitle of our book is How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Now, if we apply the logic to the whole child, well, children sure seem fragile. Newborns are, in are incredibly floppy, weak, uh, fragile, but they're tougher than they seem. And if you treat them as though they are that fragile, you will actually impede their growth. If you are always there to help them out of a fix, if you're always there when they make mistakes to fix it, then they don't develop the, the strength to do things for themselves because they know somebody will always do it. And if you're doing that through childhood, increasingly now we're seeing college students graduating and relying on their parents for help and guidance. Um, I sometimes hear in the business world, people say when they gave a young employee a bad, uh, any sort of bad evaluation, they sometimes hear from one of the parents. So parenting really has changed. The job of a parent ought to be to work yourself out of a job, but increasingly American parents and also British and Canadian and others um, 
are doing helicopter parenting, are staying involved, and that actually can slow down the growth and mature maturation of a kid. Uh, so a simple demonstration that works all over the country and in many other countries is I ask people in the audience, uh, at what age were you let out? And that means you could go outside, no supervision, walk to a friend's house, you and your friend could walk to a park or you could walk to a store, uh, you could ride your bicycles, no adult supervision. And so if that was what you did in first grade, you should say age six. If it wasn't until 11th grade that you got that freedom, you should say 16. So now I'd like to ask if there's anyone on the call who, uh, who was born before 1980, I don't know if you can put this in the chat, let's see, I think you can. Um, if you're born before 1980, just type in your number. Was it, was it age six? Was it age 14? Let's see what we get. So for uh, baby boomers and Gen X, what we're getting is mostly age six and some eights and a seven. So this is what I find all over the country. This was always the norm. Uh, in first, second or third grade, kids are let out. Um, I should also have asked uh, 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 only those who were born and raised in the United States because there are different norms in other countries. But you see the point, it's overwhelmingly six to eight. That was the norm during the crime wave when I grew up. In the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a massive crime wave, but kids played outside. The crime wave ended somewhat mysteriously in the early 90s and life got safer in every way. Not every way, in most ways. Uh, but now I'd like to ask just Gen Z. So if you were born in 1996 or later, uh, please type your number now into the chat. Okay, we still have a couple of sixes and eights, but now we begin to get 10 to 12 is, yeah. So we get a range of oh, somebody from the UK. So as you see, most people in America now, what, seven from India. Uh, so this is exactly what I find all over the country. Um, that uh, baby boom in Gen X, the answer was uh, six, seven, or eight. Uh, but for Gen Z, it's mostly 10 to 12. There are still some eights, uh, but you know, if you think about it, when I was a kid, if your parents didn't let you out until you were in fourth grade, people would be like, what is wrong with that family? Maybe, maybe someone should call the cops. Are they being chained into the house? But now if you let out a fourth grader to walk to a park, you could get arrested, or at least you could get a visit from Child Protective Services, and you could have to undergo all kinds of restrictions. So things really changed in the 1990s. Now, um, uh, what happens when kids don't have much as much unsupervised play? When they are kept inside and supervised by adults, they go to soccer practice, et cetera, but it's always adults guiding them. What happens? They don't have nearly as much uh, free play, and this appears to cause psychopathology, especially depression and anxiety. So Peter Gray at Boston College has a wonderful article and set of work um, showing how all mammals play, and play is essential for maturation. And here are all the things, I won't read the list, but here are all the things that kids learn in free play, much, much better than if they're in soccer practice or class or math tutoring. Through all these reasons, Gray says, play promotes mental health. Um, now, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago where Alison Gopnik, a well-known developmental psychologist, asked, uh, should we let our kids play with saws and knives the way they do in Germanic cultures? In Germany, Switzerland, they let kids, they, they let them have forest school, they let them chop wood, they let them light fires, and the kids learn how to do it. And what she says is trying to eliminate all such risks from children's lives might actually be dangerous. There may be a psychological analog to the hygiene hypothesis, which is what I told you before about peanuts. If, if things are too clean, the immune system doesn't learn, doesn't get stronger by, by uh, practice. Uh, an analog to the hy hygiene hypothesis, which can explain the dramatic recent increase in allergies overall, not just peanuts. And then she says, in the same way, by shielding children from every possible risk, we may lead them to react with exaggerated fear to situations that aren't risky at all. And we may isolate them from the adult skills that they will one day have to master. So in the name of keeping kids safe and protecting them from risk, we may have actually made them more vulnerable and more easily harmed by smaller and smaller risks. Uh, so I'm not saying we should go back to playgrounds like this, on this playground, you could actually die, and kids did. Kids used to die from consumer products and playgrounds uh, much more often than they do now. So of course, physical safety is very, very important. This is bad. Um, 
I think this is probably about right because on a playground like this, you can get hurt. You could fall off the rings onto the ground. Uh, kids could bash into each other, that could happen. But that means that every day, kids are getting a lot of practice in how not to get hurt. They learn to work it out. You swing first and then I'll swing. Hey, let's see if we can swing in parallel. They have to work together to avoid injury. And that's an important part of free play. <clears throat> Now, this is what my kids grew up on, and probably uh, all of you who are Gen Z had playgrounds like this. This, I think, is too safe because kids play on it and they don't get to learn how to not get hurt. In Britain, they're a little ahead of us. They recognize, they also have many fewer lawyers than we do, so they can do this, but they're beginning to recognize that kids need small risks. They like them, they explore them, and they master them. And so if you put construction materials out, take a look at this kid. He's going to learn the principle of Archimedes. Um, now, yes, he could get hit in the head. I'm not saying this is necessarily good. And I think maybe if, if there was a monitor, uh, he or she should stop this particular one. But the kid will learn a lot more than if he or she was on that prior playground. Now, where it really gets difficult or, or damaging, I think, is when our talk about safety moves from physical safety to emotional safety. Uh, and so this, this line here, we are all balloons filled with feelings in a world full of pins. Now, it's poetry and we can understand what that means and there's a kind of truth to it. But if this is the model that we repeatedly give to kids, if we encourage them to think of themselves as balloons filled with feelings in a world full of pins, and then we send them to college, we are telling them, keep your threat system on all the time. Life is dangerous and you are weak. The dictum ought to be, and it used to be, uh, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. What do we do in American universities? If anybody gets hurt, we ban the thing that hurt them. And universities literally have banned squirt guns, uh, snowball fights, uh, anything that gets anyone hurt, even at the university level. Uh, now think about it. Um, what does it take to be successful in life? Well, throughout history, we have stories about successful people who understood anti-fragility intuitively and they rejected safetyism. So Demosthenes is a famous Greek orator and um, he had a stammering problem. He had a bad, uh, he had trouble speaking, but he wanted to present his family's case. They had a court case and the court in those days was the people of Athens assembled in the public square. And so to prepare for the trial, he would put pebbles in his mouth and then give his oration so that when he took the pebbles out, it was easier. Or he would run sprints up hills so that when he was at the top of the hill, he was out of breath and give his oration so that when he wasn't out of breath, it was easier. And Olympic athletes still do that today. They train at high altitudes, which is harder on their bodies. Their body toughens up, uh, hemoglobin levels change so that when they are at a lower altitude, they're stronger. But what do we do at America's top universities? We have created an ultra low altitude environment. We do everything we can that there will not be conflicts, there will not be uh, reasons to be upset. We create an artificially safe environment so that when they graduate, go out into the real world, they will find it much more painful. Um, now, let me be clear, and one or two of you mentioned this in the chat, um, this principle of anti-fragility has important limits. Um, it is absolutely the case that trauma, especially in early childhood, does nothing good. And so protecting kids from sexual abuse, uh, from, from parents who beat them, uh, these things leave permanent scars and there's a big literature on adverse childhood experiences. So I'm saying risks and things like that within the, within the range of what the child is ready for. I'm not saying the, you know, what doesn't kill you always makes you stronger. It really could damage you. Secondly, I am saying that stress is valuable if it's short-term stress. Chronic stress is bad. There's nothing good about chronic stress. That overloads your, your whole body with cortisol. It does all kinds of bad things. So secure attachment, uh, occasional stress, but not chronic stress, those are good things. And finally, it is absolutely the case, especially in America, that poor kids and rich kids are going to be walking on very different roads. And the roads the poor kids are walking on are much more dangerous and, and difficult and full of obstacles. And so we, we, need, we have a big problem with inequality. And so we do have to do some road repair um, in, in poor neighborhoods, on ramps to opportunity. So again, I'm not saying, hey, uh, you know, kids, toughen up. 
I'm just saying, especially in sort of the upper middle class or middle class and upper class environments, parenting and schooling has, I think, created much weaker and more fragile kids. Um, so with those caveats in mind, uh, Nassim Taleb has this beautiful piece of advice. He says, you want to be the fire and wish for the wind. A fire is fragile, a puff of wind will blow it out. But once it gets to be a roaring fire, the more you blow on it, the stronger it gets. Okay, now, why did this all burst out in 2014? Um, I'm gonna just spend a moment on point number two, rising anxiety and depression. So these are the stats for, the, for Gen Z or for all the generations. Um, this is the percentage of college students, or I'm sorry, of 12th graders who have a driver's license. And so in the 70s and 80s, almost everybody got their driver's license immediately after their birthday. Uh, but it begins dro dropping even before Uber comes into play. Uh, but Gen Z is much less likely to have gotten a driver's license. And uh, in part, they're not going out drinking, which is good, but they often have never even tried alcohol. They often have never even gone out on a date and they uh, often uh, have never had a summer job or any kind of work for pay. And if you think about what our expectations are for students arriving on a college campus, for those who go to a residential campus, we kind of expect that they have a level of independence where they can drive themselves around. They have some facility with romantic interactions. They have some experience of work, uh, work for pay. And that is increasingly untrue about Gen Z. Now it might just be that childhood is lengthening and that's okay, but the evidence is pretty clear that it's not okay. And so what we see here is on the left, representative data on American college students in 2010, 2012, it was all uh, millennials. By 2016, it's all Gen Z. And look what happens. Uh, learning disabilities, ADHD are only up a little bit, but psychological disorders have more than doubled, more than doubled. Um, and it's, it's exactly as the millennials leave and Gen Z comes into college. But it's not all psychological disorders. Um, and it's not even across the, the two sexes. So when the millennials were the students, those were the rates of major depression. Now, this is, this is uh, American teens, not college students. As soon as Gen Z shows up in the data set, the rate for boys goes up, the rate for girls goes way up. Uh, the percentage increases are sort of similar ballpark, but the girls increase is a much larger number of points because it starts higher. Similar data from college students, when the millennials were in college, the levels were um, relatively low and were stable. They were not rising. As soon as Gen Z shows up, the levels begin to rise, especially for, the, uh, for, millennia, for Gen Z women. Uh, it's depression and anxiety, only depression and anxiety. Uh, nothing else. Now, uh, some people have argued that it's just a change in diagnostic criteria, that Gen Z is just really comfortable talking about depression. This is a good thing. And he says, relax, there's no, there's no explosion of anxiety and digital media and social media are not doing any damage. Don't worry about it. Um, I believe that he is wrong. It's, it was a reasonable hypothesis, but I believe the evidence is now in that it's not just self-report data. So this is hard data. That is, this is the number per 100,000 of boys in the United States uh, who were admitted to hospitals for self-harm. Now, there's no trend here. I just want to show you. The boys are, have not changed on self-harm. It's not really a boy thing. Um, girls manifest anxiety with self-harm much more often. So what we see here for American girls and young women is that the raw numbers are much higher uh, than for boys, but there was no trend from 2001 to 2009. Again, the millennials were stable. They were not increasing in their psychopathology. But as soon as Gen Z begins to come into the data set, look what happens. Uh, the oldest teenage girls are the ones who most, you know, most uh, suffer from anxiety in this way and most cut themselves. Their rate went up 62% just in the few years after 2009. Uh, and the youngest girls who didn't used to cut themselves, their rate nearly tripled, nearly tripled. The oldest group in this sample are, these are actually millennials all the way through. So you see they didn't go up. So Gen Z, something is happening to Gen Z, especially Gen Z girls, such that they're experiencing rapidly rising rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, and suicide. What we see here is the suicide rate for 10 to 14 year old kids. Uh, 10 to 14 year olds have very low rates, but they have increased a lot in recent years. The girls rate is up 151% compared to the first decade of this century. So this is not just self-report. This is not just changes in diagnostic criteria. Um, so in 2014, 2015, 2016, 
as far as I can tell, every campus in the country experienced a big rise at their mental health centers. Suddenly students are flocking to the mental health center saying, I'm depressed and I'm anxious. Uh, we have a lot more on this if you want. If you go to thecoddling.com, uh, we have data on what's happening internationally in a variety of countries. It is happening in all of the English speaking countries, less so uh, on the continent of Europe uh, and in Latin America, but there are, there are beginnings of this, but it is happening in all of the English speaking countries in a very similar form. Now, why is this happening at the same time in multiple countries and with a bigger impact on girls? Why is that? Um, there are several reasons, but I think the biggest reason is the transformation of American teen social life between 2009 and 2011. So here's the data on that. So in 2006, Facebook opens up to the world. Before then, you had to be a college student. And so many millennials got Facebook in college, but by then their brains were largely developed and they weren't damaged by it. Um, Gen Z is, is young at this time. They're in elementary or middle school, uh, but they're allowed on, especially because they can just lie um, and say about their age. But very few, very few Gen Z kids are actually on in 2006. Now, in 2007, the iPhone comes out, and now it's possible to have Facebook or other social media with you all the time to check thousands of times a day. But the iPhone's expensive, and very few preteens have one. By 2009, the prices come down. Uh, now it starts becoming much more common. What you see in this graph is the percentage of kids in each grade um, who are using social media, social networking sites almost every day. And what you see here is that 2009 to 2011 is the two year period where the slope is steepest. This is the fastest period of adoption. Uh, in 2009, Facebook adds the like button, Twitter adds the retweet button, social media gets much more engaging, and it becomes much more a place to spread outrage. Um, so a lot changes between 2009 and 2011. By 2012, kids are not going over to each other's houses as much. They're not go walking around, they're not doing stuff. They go home and they communicate on social media. Um, and so the timing of that shift fits perfectly. This is the two year window when American teen life changed. It's also uh, just as Gen Z is hitting adolescence. And I believe uh, this is a big part of the cause of Gen Z being different from, uh, from the millennials. Uh, it also perfectly explains the sex difference because boys and girls are on their screens all day long, but boys are doing a lot of gaming and gaming is not bad for you. Now it pushes out other things, but the research on gaming doesn't show any evidence that it increases depression or anxiety. In fact, it's generally very social, these multiplayer games, my son does it. Um, it's the only way in COVID that he can interact with his friends. So the boys are not really harmed by their screen time, but the girls are spending much more time on social media. And girls we've known for a long time are more affected by constant social comparison, especially about their body, their attractiveness, their hair. Um, girls are more affected than by fear of missing out than our boys. Everyone hates it, but it, it hurts girls more. And finally, boys and girls are equally aggressive, but boys' aggression and bullying is physical. So when they go online, they can't hurt each other physically. Uh, whereas girls' aggression is generally relational. They damage each other's reputations or friendships. And when they everybody moves online, now it becomes easier to do this all day long, even on the weekends. So if you're interested in this, again, go to thecoddling.com and we have a lot more, a lot more stuff on this. I'm gonna skip bad idea number two, always trust your feelings, we just don't have time. Instead, I wanna focus on this one, which is in, my God, it is just exploding, um, not just on college campuses, but throughout our country, throughout the corporate world, throughout uh, fancy private schools are being torn apart by this ancient view of life as a battle between good people and evil people. So. Uh, the opposite of that is the psychological principle that, you know what, we are all prone to dichotomous thinking and tribalism. This is a flaw, this is a problem in human thinking. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn has a wonderful line, I won't read the whole thing, but he says, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Uh, my wife is rereading a lot of Russian literature now, and boy do the great Russian novelists understand this. In great literature, people are complicated. You don't have cartoon heroes and villains. Uh, now we combine this with um, our hypocrisy. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own? So we're very good at seeing the other people are evil, our side is good. And now we combine this with tribalism, the old Bedouin saying, I against my brothers, I and my brothers against my cousins, I and my brothers and cousins against the world. And you get the explosion of moralistic tribalism, us versus them. 
Uh, and this is what came onto campuses around 2015. Uh, so there was a lot of writing at the time. Uh, here's an essay from a student at Smith, Walking on Eggshells, How Political Correctness is Changing the Campus Dynamic. I won't read the whole thing, uh, but she talks about how she showed up in, I think, 2014, 2015, and she saw lots of people being told that their opinion was wrong, it was offensive, and how quickly her freshman class uh, learned a new way of not thinking, of not talking, of detecting wrong thinking in others. And then she says, I began to voice my opinion less often, to avoid being berated and judged by a community that claims to represent the free expression of ideas. I learned along with every other student to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. And this again is what flooded across, especially first the elite campuses in 2015, this fear of being called out and therefore a silencing. And uh, uh, Heterodox Academy just put out a report finding that it, it keeps increasing. It's, it's, it, students report more self-silencing now than they did even a year ago. Um, it affects faculty too. Uh, we're very concerned if, if we, we have to teach to the most easily offended student because we can be reported to a biased response team. So it chills, it chills risk taking, it chills provocation. It makes us all, well, I shouldn't say all, it makes many of us more cautious, uh, more reserved, uh, uh, more, we stick to what's safe in what we teach. Now at the heart of this uh, uh, new int intellectual or moral movement, um, is the idea of intersectionality, which at its core is a very good idea. So if you watch Kimberly Crenshaw's TED talk, she makes a very strong case. It's, I, I agree with everything she says in the talk, that we have to understand that people's experience in this country are not the sum of, you know, it's not just the sum of being black and female. That's not what it is to be a black woman. There are unique indignities and obstacles that black women face that others don't. And unless you have a name for this, unless you can identify it, you can't understand it, you can't um, ameliorate it. So the core idea of intersectionality is a very good idea. I'm not criticizing that. The problem, I think, is that as it's taught on campus, you take 18 year olds who are, who are prone to dichotomous thinking anyway and tribal thinking, and you teach them to see the world as a set of binaries. Some people are white, others are non-white. Some people are cisgender, others are transgender. Now, well, of course that's true. Do we wanna emphasize this way of judging people based on their category? Especially because these are moral categories. Those above the line are said to be privileged and that makes them morally bad. They are the oppressors. People below the line are morally good because they are the victims. And if we teach kids to look around, you know, here you are on campus, are you a kid in a candy shop? Well, no, actually I am enmeshed in a matrix of oppression. There are very different ways to look at the world. Um, now, intersectionality helps you focus on certain intersections. And the most important intersection of all is the cisgender heterosexual white male. That is those, that's the top of the power structure. Those are the people who oppress the others. Those are the bad people. They are the cause of our problems. And uh, lest you think I'm exaggerating here, this is a handout from a leadership training course, uh, an Ivy League school, I won't say which, uh, a friend sent this to me last year, two years ago. Uh, and this is what students are learning in their leadership course. They're learning here, I'll zoom in on it, uh, but you see it's privileged and oppressed groups. And you see, okay, cisgender men are the privileged and they oppress everyone else. White people oppress everyone else. Top management oppresses everyone else. Heterosexuals oppress everyone else. 28 to 52 year olds oppress everyone else. Now, is this, is this a good filter? Is this the way that we should be teaching people to look at the world? Is this the way that parents and children should understand their, their interactions? Is this the way that we should think about employment relationships as exploitation? Sometimes it is, but usually things are more complicated. Uh, so I think this is a very, very bad thing to teach to young people, given our tribal minds. And this is what really showed up in 2014, 2015, what, what, what Greg and I call common identity, I'm sorry, common enemy identity politics. So you have, uh, this is just a few blocks north of me here at NYU, this is at the new school. Uh, so a space reserved um, only for people who are other than straight white people. Um, it's not for, anyway, so this idea that everyone else is oppressed and they need a safe space away from those people, this is, let's unite against them. 
um, it's not just the universities. So Sarah Jong was hired by the New York Times after she had a lot of tweets talking about how much she hates white people, uh, old white men, et cetera, et cetera. So hatred of the oppressors is a good thing. That's called punching up. That's a good thing to do. Um, and uh, Jessica Valenti tweeted, uh, Sarah Jong is good, her haters are bad, it's not difficult. Well, that's great untruth number three right there. The world is divided, the world's life is a battle between the good people and the evil people. It's easy. Uh, now, in the book, we're very clear, you have to have identity politics, the university. You have to have ways that groups can advocate for their interests or point out uh, obstacles or, or uh, real offenses. But the civil rights movement developed ways of dealing with this. And one of them really works. It's not let's unite against the evil people. It's let's emphasize our common humanity and then call on their higher nature. As Pauli Murray said, she was a, a gay or we would, might not say trans uh, black woman um, who got a degree in divinity uh, uh, and also in law from Yale. She said, I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods. When my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. This is the kind of identity politics that worked in the civil rights movement. This is the kind that produces much more effective altruism, I'm sorry, activism today. Shaming and blaming and attacking people, it might make them silent, but it turns them against you and your cause. So if, if for those on this call who are, uh, who are uh, uh, into activism, um, think about whether you are engaging in acts that will actually win people over and advance your cause, or whether you're engaging in acts that gain you prestige in your group, but that may actually backfire uh, in actually changing the world. So to conclude a few brief pieces of advice, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, so some of you on this call are older. I assume some of you are parents. If you want to know a lot more, we have more at thecoddling.com for parents, but also a great organization. Go to letgrow.org. has all kinds of advice, especially if you have kids under 12. Uh, there's so much you can do to give them more free play and help them grow up uh, stronger and less likely to become depressed or anxious. Uh, secondly, if you're a professor or administrator, it's very important that you not buy into this language. If you buy into the language of fragility uh, and, um, uh, you know, and power structures and all of that, you're going to validate the idea that students are emotionally at risk on your campus. Uh, Ruth Simmons, the first uh, African-American president of an Ivy League school, put it beautifully when she said, learning is the antithesis of comfort. The collision of views and ideologies is in the DNA of the academic enterprise. We do not need any collision avoidance technology here. Uh, we've developed a specific tool that you can use. So uh, Caroline Mell and I developed Open Mind. If you go to openmindplatform.org, um, it, it walks, it, it, it takes a few hours to go through the, the multiple modules. It was, it's ideal for orientation as students arrive at university, but it can be used in a classroom. We have thousands of professors have used it in their classroom. It can be used in a company, it can be used in a church group. Any group that is gonna have difficult discussions will benefit uh, by assigning open mind. It's free, you can just go to the site, get a, get a link, send it out. Uh, and finally, if you are a Gen Z student, as many of you are on this call, um, learn about what's happening to your generation. Uh, Jean Twenge's book, iGen, it was criticized at the time, uh, but it turns out all the trends she identified have gotten a lot worse. The mental illness uh, issues that I showed you uh, have gotten a lot worse since she published this book. So learn about what's happening to your generation. And then it's very important that you be explicit to the adults who are doing this for your own good, they think, Tell them to back off, stop overprotecting you, uh, let you face challenges by yourself, let you and your, and your peers work out problems by yourself. Um, adults aren't gonna back off unless you ask them uh, because they're afraid if they back off and someone gets hurt, then they could get sued. But at least if you say, if you, if you ask them to give you more room, more independence, um, they might. Uh, and finally, you're in a good position. If you want a cause, your generation is doing really, really badly advocate for change for those younger than you. Um, for example, maybe go to Let Grow and see if you could uh, if, uh, advocate for their programs there. Um, and finally, I'll close with this amazing piece of advice from Van Jones. He gave a talk at the University of Chicago uh, in which they had just had a, a talk by somebody in the Trump administration. And some of the students said that they felt unsafe, that we should not let anyone from the Trump administration speak uh, on our campus. 
it was actually Corey Lewandowski, who I forget if it was the Trump campaign or whatever, but he was associated with Trump, students protested, uh, ultimately his talk went to him. And Van Jones is being interviewed um, um, uh, in a, a political science uh, uh, colloquium. And he's asked what he thinks about safe spaces and that sort of stuff. And he says, I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong and that's different. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. I'm not going to take all the weights out of the gym. That's the whole point of the gym. This, the university, is the gym. So uh, to conclude, um, I, I, I thank you for your attention. And for those of you who are, who are uh, Gen Z or late millennials, I urge you to think that you are the fire and go find some wind. Thanks, John, for this talk. I thought it was excellent. You can see in the chat that a lot of people um, really enjoyed it. And I want to thank the audience for coming today. And don't forget that um, Adam Smith Week events continue all, all this week at College of Charleston, as well as our event on April 1st. So um, hopefully I'll see you then. Everybody stay um, safe and stay well.